Hello everyone, it's Audrey Moore here at Wonders of Wildlife National Museum and Aquarium. We are so excited to have you here as we introduce our newest mission for the month of January through mission conservation adaptations. Throughout the month of January, you will get to meet multiple partners and learn all about animal adaptations. In order to play this really fun mission, all you have to do is go on over to our mission conservation page at www.wondersofwildlife.org slash mission dash conservation. That will bring you to our mission conservation webpage. On this website, I'll bring your attention down to the Get the App. Once you click download, that will take you to download the mission, the Agents of Discovery app, which you will need to play any mission conservation mission. Once you have that app downloaded, create a user account and log in. Make sure to hit the search bar and type in mission conservation and you will be able to see all of our at home missions and they will pop up for you to play. Once you have the mission popped up and loaded, you can hit play and go ahead and start playing those really awesome games. Now make sure to check out our featured missions for this month, including our adaptations mission. And you will also be able to find more animal related activities in the schedule of missions and activities. This tab will show you all of the missions that we currently have live, as well as our activity guide that we have made specifically for you at home. There will be a craft, an awesome outdoor activity, and something that you can do to promote conservation. So I'm currently standing here in our Year of the Bird exhibit. This exhibit pays tribute to one of America's first naturalists, John James Audubon. Did you know that owls have specifically designed feathers that make their flight virtually silent? To tell us more about animal adaptations, we have Emily Davis, the Director of Educational Programs from the Great Plains Nature Center. So to start us off, Emily, how are you doing today? Hi, Audrey. Thanks so much for having me. I'm doing well. Um, I'm so excited to be here with you guys from Wichita, Kansas, from the Great Plains Nature Center. Um, we are an awesome partnership here in Wichita, where the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, um, Kansas Department of Wildlife and Parks, City of Wichita, and our nonprofit group, Friends of the Great Plains Nature Center, come together to be able to put together um, nature programs like the ones you guys are going to see today. So we are gonna go ahead and just hop right in and start talking about raptors. Um, if you've never heard of raptors or if you have heard of raptors and you just automatically think of dinosaurs when you hear raptors, um, you're not totally wrong since we're talking about birds and they're you know related to dinosaurs. Um, but today we're gonna be talking about the raptors that are still living today. Um, they are also known as birds of prey. And so we are gonna be talking about how these birds of prey are adapted to hunt. So of course, raptors are things like falcons, owls, eagles, um, hawks, those are all birds of prey um, that are adapted to be able to go out, hunt, kill, and catch their food. And so these are carnivorous birds that are eating other living things. So we're going to talk about their app adaptations. But first, let's go over what an adaptation even is. Um, so an adaptation is going to be changes over time in a species that help them to be able to survive in their environment. Um, so this is at the species level. So looking specifically at a um, peregrine falcon, like you see in this picture, or a golden eagle. Um, so those are different species. And those changes, those adaptations happen at that species level. And it helps them to be able to better survive in their environment. So whether they are living in a forest or if they are living by a lake, they're living in a prairie or a desert, they're gonna be differently adapted to be able to survive in those areas or adapted based off of what kind of food they eat too, which is kind of what we're talking about today. So looking at these adaptations with raptors, um, what we're gonna see with these guys is that their senses, their stealth and their speed um, is really what makes them the dominant predator of the skies. Um, so we're going to look specifically at those amazing senses, that amazing stealthiness and speed that they have, and all of these different kinds of raptors. Um, and they are really, really well adapted to be able to hunt, to be able to survive. So the very first one that we are going to start out with is going to be senses. 
So these birds of prey or raptors are using their senses to be able to find their food, right? Because before you get to the eating part, you have to get to find the food first. Um, so these amazing senses enable them to be able to pinpoint their prey from great heights and really far away distances too. So the first sense that we're gonna look at with these birds of prey is going to be their sight. Um, so these guys have absolutely amazing sight. So they are using their eyes and even from looking at these two pictures on the screen, um, probably one of the first things you notice is those giant eyeballs, especially on the owl. Um, so they have these huge eyes and um, with owls, they take up a really big portion of their faces. Um, so with owls, it's about 40% of the volume of their heads. Um, so if I were like a giant human owl, which would be kind of scary, um, but that would mean that I would basically have eyes the size of tennis balls on my head. So that is a huge portion of their face that is just taken up um, by their eyes. So the sense of sight is really important for a lot of birds of prey, um, especially owls, since they are nocturnal and they are hunting at nighttime. They need to have really well adapted sight to help them to be able to see at um, nighttime. So these eyes aren't just for looks, their sight is a lot better than us humans. So in this next picture, what you're going to see um, is the skull of an owl and also a picture of a camera. And we'll kind of get to, to why we have a picture of a camera here. But looking at that skull of the owl, probably one thing that you'll notice that's very different from human skulls is that they have these giant tubes around their eyeballs, which is really weird. We don't have those giant tubes around our eyes. And what that does is that it is stabilizing their eyes whenever they're flying at really high speeds. Um, and it also makes their eyes tube shaped. So they don't have round spherical eyes like we do. They have tube shaped eyes, which is kind of strange, but that means that their eyes are able to work kind of like a zoom lens on a camera. So that's why we have this picture of the camera. So you can see that long zoom lens that helps you to be able to see things um, that are really far away, like they're just right up close to you. So that's basically how raptor or bird of prey eyes work all of the time. Um, it just looks like everything that's really far away is actually right up close to them. Um, so that means they have really strong binocular vision, um, but they can have a slight farsightedness, which means that things up close that are actually close to them can be a little bit blurry. But whenever they're hunting their food, it's really, really helpful to be able to see things that are crazy far away. Now, there's something else about their sight um, that is kind of strange, and we see this in a lot of different animals. This next picture has a picture of a barn owl, and you can see that their eyes look like they're glowing. You may have seen this in um, your dogs or cats if you have any pets at home or maybe like a raccoon that's wandering around at night. This is something called eye shine, which is caused by a tapetum lucidum. Um, so that is basically like a mirror on their eye that actually reflects light within their eyes. So what that does is allow as much light as possible to be able to reach their eyes, even when it's completely dark outside. So you can imagine that is really helpful for animals that are nocturnal, like these owls or the raccoons or even cats um, that you might have at home. So this is incredibly helpful. Even on the darkest of nights, they are able to still have light in their eyes and help them to be able to see whenever they're walking around or flying around at night looking for their food. One last thing about sight that's a little different from humans especially is that these guys are able to see something that is completely visible invisible to us. So you will see here an American kestrel and some really blurry grayscale pictures which look kind of confusing um, but I'll tell you what those are all about. So these American kestrels as well as uh, rough-legged hawks are able to see wavelengths of light that we cannot see. Um, so they can actually see ultraviolet light. Um, totally invisible to us humans, but what that does for these guys is that they are able to see urine trails that are left by rodents as they are running throughout their habitats. So that seems kind of weird. Why would a Kestrel you know, be worried about seeing a urine trail? Well, if that urine trail is glowing in that UV light, 
Um, that basically means that the American kestrel can follow that urine trail right to the little rodent that is leaving, leading it. So they are incredibly helpful for being able to um, find their prey and catch them because these guys like lots of um, rodents to eat, just like a lot of birds of prey. Birds of prey absolutely love to eat rodents um, that are running around. So that urine is going to fluoresce and glow brightly, making it really, really easy for the American kestrel to be able to find that rodent that is leaving the trail. So that's enough about sight. We get that these guys have really amazing eyesight, but another sense that helps them out is going to be their hearing. So let's talk a little bit about their hearing. Um, you might be looking at these pictures and say, I don't see any ears. And you're right, you don't see any ears. Uh, they don't have external ears like we do. You might be able to feel your external ears, um, those big ears that you have on the side of your head. Uh, these guys, birds, do not have those. Instead, they have just basically little holes on the side of their head, and that is just completely covered up in those feathers. Um, so they don't have the external structure, they just have the internal structures of ears that are hidden under those feathers. Um, so you would think that would hamper their ability to hear. It'd be kind of like putting headphones over your ears, right? But usually these feathers will actually help them to be able to conduct sound. So these next pictures that we're going to look at are a little strange looking, but they help you to be able to see um, how the shape of those feathers, like on this barn owl picture, um, actually helps funnel sound back to their ears. And on that right picture, you can see he's using some blue tweezers um, to be able to pull back the feathers so you can actually see what that ear looks like. So that is their internal ear right there. So the stiff feathers that are lining these owls, especially um, dish-shaped face, helps conduct sound right to their ears. Um, so adaptations like this make owls be able, um, are able to quickly localize sounds, even when it's completely dark outside. They can just turn their head and use those ears to be able to pinpoint exactly where a sound from oh, a lizard or a snake, another bird, um, or of course rats and mice. They can hear exactly where those little guys are making movements at so that they can find them and catch them for food. So this video that we're gonna look at next um, shows how well this hearing can really help them to be able to find their food. I always feel a little bad for the Kestrel after watching that video, um, cause she tried really, really hard to be able to find that vole. Um, but the barn owl, as we can see, was just better adapted to be able to finding something um, that it couldn't see. And so even in the raptor world, you see that different birds of prey um, are adapted differently, even at the senses level. So their sights and their hearing are adapted differently um, based on their lifestyle. So we were looking at a nocturnal animal with that owl and then a diurnal animal or an animal that is awake during the day, which would be the kestrel. Um, so it's cool to see how these different adaptations end up working out when people are, or when these animals are competing for food. So we are done with senses. So the next thing that we're going to look at is how these birds of prey ambush their prey. So we've used our senses, um, been able to catch or pinpoint the food, find the food, and now they have to be able to get it. Um, so let's look at how these guys are adapted to ambush and catch their food. So first one we're going to look at is stealth. A lot of birds of prey, especially owls, are going to use stealth to be able to sneak up on their food because if the prey doesn't even hear you coming, then you have a pretty good chance at being able to catch it. So there are a lot of different ways that these guys will use stealth to find their food. And we're going to watch a little video that shows you one of those ways. love that video. Um, this video does a really great job of showing how well owl wings are adapted to conceal sound. So owls have these incredibly soft um, kind of velvety feathers that basically dampen any sound. So they're especially able to glide right over um, those microphones without it hardly anything being picked up. So you can see how loud that pigeon was, which was the first bird, and then the peregrine falcon was. Um, there was absolutely no 
no way that those guys were near as quiet as the owl was. Um, so not even every raptor is adapted to be quite as silent as owls are. Um, a lot of times, uh, there's no way that a prey animal, even like a rodent that also has really good hearing, is going to be able to hear an owl coming. So that is one way that they can be super stealthy. Another way is that they could just hide in plain sight. So this picture shows um, just some of the elaborate markings that some birds can have with their feathers. Um, so you can see how this great gray owl's feathers are um, completely well adapted to be able to blend right in with that tree that it is hanging out on. And of course, again, adaptations have to do with surviving in the environment that they are living in. Um, so these guys are adapted to be able to live around trees or in a forest. So that's why their camouflage reflects that. Um, you can see even in this next picture, we have another owl um, called an Eastern Screech Owl where it has completely turned around its head. You can't even see its eyeballs. So it's really hard to notice that there is even an owl there, um, especially without those big eyes looking at you. It looks like it practically disappears within those trees. So stealth is something that works incredibly well for a lot of birds of prey. But if they do not use stealth, a lot of times they will use speed. Um, so you can see this peregrine falcon pictured just diving right down. So um, even if stealth isn't their thing, they're just going to rely on speed because if you're fast enough that the prey item, whether it's a rodent, um, a fish even, anything like that, um, if you're fast enough for them not to even get away, um, you have a really, really good chance of still catching them, even if you're not sneaking up on them. And some raptors can reach incredible speeds before striking with a deadly impact. So to kind of get an idea of how fast raptors actually can be, let's compare it to some humans. So right here we have Usain Bolt, um, who is the fastest human ever. He was recorded at running 27 miles per hour. So crazy fast, fastest human alive. Most humans cannot even get close to that. Um, but that is still nothing compared to a lot of birds of prey. So we have another little American kestrel right here who pretty regularly hits speeds of 60 miles per hour whenever he's chasing down prey. Um, so this is a tiny little bird who has easily doubled the speed of the fastest human alive, which is just crazy to me. Um, you can see those really sweet, sleek wings um, that the American kestrel has that are nice and slender, and those help them to be able to be very agile in the air and be able to dive down um, incredibly fast. So let's look at a couple of other birds because the American kestrel is definitely not the fastest bird. Um, right here, we have a red-tailed hawk. Those guys will usually hit about 120 miles per hour whenever they are diving uh, straight down. So these guys can basically dive bomb at a high speed to be able to reach their target. So they're just gonna tuck in their wings and stoop or dive bomb down vertically to be able to get there incredibly fast to catch their food. Um, but again, that's still not the fastest. Here on the right, we have the peregrine falcon, which is the fastest living thing alive, which can dive down at 240 miles per hour. Crazy fast. So that is the fastest living thing alive. And so they have to be incredibly well adapted to be able to even survive that with their body. Like that is really fast for their little bodies to go. Um, but they are adapted to be able to survive that and handle that great speed as they are diving down to catch their food. So let's see what this, that looks like in this next video. So that is so crazy. You can kind of see at the very last second um, they speedily adjust their bodies to be able to get those extremely sharp talons around the pigeon's body. And so that is the very last thing that we're going to look at, that last adaptation, um, which is the killing blow. So that killing blow um, by all raptors, all birds of prey, is going to be with those big talons, those giant talons that you can see in this picture that are nice and curved and sharp. And that is what, whether they use um, stealth or speed, that's what they have to be able to catch and kill 
that food at the very end. So we've looked at a lot of different adaptations today and we're gonna just take a quick closer look using a real um, bird of prey. So we have the American Kestrel here at the Great Plains Nature Center. His name is Tito. So I'm gonna take just a second to get him out so we can take a closer look. All right, so again, this is the American Kestrel. This is Tito. So he is one of our animal ambassadors here at the Great Plains Nature Center. Move this way. <laughs> um, so he is a type of falcon. Um, so peregrine falcon, they're kind of in that same family together. Um, but this obviously is a lot smaller. This is the smallest falcon in North America and it is also the most widespread. Um, so these are um, guys that you can see pretty much all over the place in North America. I know here in Kansas, we have them statewide and they stay here all year round. Um, a lot of people don't really notice them because of their small size. Um, since this is as big as they get, this is a full grown adult male kestrel. Um, so people will see them like up on like a telephone line or a pole or a fence. And they might not even realize that it's actually a bird of prey just because of the size. It looks more like a, a pigeon or a quail or something. Um, but it is a bird of prey. So he has those awesome talons. Figure out which way to move them. There it goes. He has those talons that you can see right there on the glove sitting down. And so they are not as big as a lot of other birds of prey since this is a smaller animal. Um, but they are still curved and sharp. And they are perfect for catching things like small rodents, um, small songbirds, grasshoppers, anything like that, that he is going to catch um, while he's out hunting for food. These guys are incredibly well adapted to prairies and wide open spaces. Uh, they love to have a lot of um, wide open spaces to be able to see incredibly far away using those nice big eyes that he has on his face. Um, one really cool thing about these guys, they have an extra little adaptation if they are a falcon, um, and that is on their beak. So they do have the nice curved, um, sharp beak like other birds of prey, but on top of that, they have something called a tomial tooth. So it's not a real tooth because birds do not have teeth. Um, they just swallow their food whole without chewing, um, but it is an extra little ridge on their beak that they use to be able to um, sever spinal cords. So they just bite their prey's neck and that immediately will um, kill them just very quickly so that they're able to chow down um, without too much fighting back. So that's especially helpful for rodents because rodents have very, very sharp teeth that can do a lot of damage to these little birds. So that is really nice that they don't get hurt whenever they're trying to just eat their food and be able to survive. The very last thing that we'll look at before I turn it over to Audrey is those wings. So again, we talked a little bit about um, how these guys are gonna primarily use speed. So he can dive down at about 60 miles per hour. And that is all because of the shape of these wings. Owls in comparison have really blunt kind of short wings, um, especially an owl that's a lot smaller like this size. Um, but these guys have nice, beautiful, slender wings that even will cross over because of the way that they're shaped. Um, and that lets you know that this is a falcon who is going to be able to use speed to be able to catch his food since they even cross over like that. So they are very agile in the air and they are um, definitely one of the birds of prey that is a dominant predator of the skies who uses those senses, that speed and that stealth to be able to hunt their food. So thank you guys so much for having me and I'll turn it back over to you, Audrey. Awesome. Thank you so much, Emily and Tito for joining us today and providing us with that awesome information all about birds of prey. Now it is unfortunately time to end the live stream today, but I did want to remind you that if you subscribe and add the little bell, you can get notifications for our upcoming live streams. You can also go to our YouTube page and watch the rest of our live streams that we have done in the past, as well as upcoming. We look forward to seeing you on February 8th. That will be our next live stream where we kick off exploring winter. And we will be hearing from lots of really cool partners to teach us all about the things you can do in winter. So we will see you next time. Thank you so much for joining today.